hi, welcome back. In this video, we are going to go through the atomic theory. So atomic theory actually began a long time ago, back in 332 BC, and it all started with Aristotle. And you've probably heard of him before, but maybe not in science class. Aristotle was a philosopher, and he believed that all matter was made out of four elements. And those four elements are earth, air, fire, and water, which if you've ever watched the show Avatar, that probably sticks out to you. So Aristotle believed that all matter was made of these four elements, and many people believed him. So a few years after Aristotle, Democritus, he was another Greek philosopher in around 400 BC, Democritus hypothesized that all matter was made out of indivisible particles that he called atomos, which is actually where we get the word atom from. So Democritus had this theory that all matter was made out of indivisible particles. And the problem with Aristotle and Democritus is they didn't have any scientific data. There was no data to back up their theories. They didn't do any experiments or any tests. They just assumed that this was the way that the world worked based off of their philosophy and their view on life. And unfortunately, many people thought that Democritus was crazy and they did not understand how matter could be made out of tiny indivisible particles that we can't even see. So many people believed Aristotle because he was a very famous philosopher. So this set us back in the atomic theory by about 2000 years, which is just crazy to think about. If we had believed Democritus in the first place, maybe we would have made some advancements in the atomic theory well before the 19th century, but unfortunately that did not happen. It wasn't until the early 1800s, so almost 2,000 years later, that another scientist came onto the scene, and his name was John Dalton. And Dalton made an atomic theory based off of evidence. So this was not just a theory that he pieced together through philosophy. This was actually based on scientific evidence. And there were a few things in his theory that are important to note. So John Dalton worked with compounds and he noticed that any time compounds were made, they were actually made in the same exact ratio every time. So for example, water is always H2O. It's never H3O or H2O2 or HO. It's always H2O. There's always the same formula for a given compound. So Dalton's theory began by saying that everything was made out of atoms, which is what Democritus actually said back in 400 BC. He also hypothesized that atoms couldn't be created and they couldn't be destroyed. He also thought that all atoms of a given element were completely identical. So for example, all carbon atoms would weigh the exact same and have the exact same properties every single time. He also thought that atoms for different elements were completely different. So for example, an, an atom of gold would be completely different than an atom of silver. So atoms of different elements were not alike. And then the last part of his theory had to do with compounds and he said that atoms could come together and form compounds. And they will always form in the same ratio. Not too long after Dalton came another important discovery in our atomic theory, and that came from J.J. Thompson. And this was in the 1890s to early 1900s. Thompson discovered the electron. And he discovered this by using something called a cathode ray tube. And in his tube, he had a stream of particles moving through his tube and he held positively and negatively charged plates up against his tube. So let's say this was the negative and this was the positive. And what he found was that the negative plate deflected the stream of particles. So he knew that these particles must have a negative charge and he called them electrons. 
And Thompson's theory of the atom was that most of the atom was made up of positive matter sprinkled with some negative electrons mixed in. So his theory is called the chocolate chip cookie model, or if you're in the UK, it's known as the plum pudding model. But if we looked at like a chocolate chip cookie, the cookie itself, the cookie matter would be the positive matter and negative electrons would be the chocolate chip spread randomly throughout the atom. And he thought this was positive matter because he knew overall that the atom itself is neutral. So if there were negatively charged particles within the atom, that means that there must be a positive charge somewhere in there. And Thompson just assumed that the atom itself was made out of positive matter. A few years after Thompson's experiments, Rutherford came onto the scene. In the early 1900s, around 1907, Rutherford actually discovered protons and the nucleus. What Rutherford did was he shot positively charged particles at gold atoms. If the atom looked like Thompson's model, those positively charged particles should just pass right on through because there's not a dense positively charged area in a chocolate chip cookie. All of the positive matter is just equally spread out and there's some electrons here and there, but overall positively charged particles should just flow right through that matter. But that is not what happened. When Rutherford shot the gold atoms with positively charged particles, some of them hit the gold and bounced off in the opposite direction, which means they had to hit something that was very densely positively charged. Most of the particles though went straight through the gold, which made Rutherford think, well, maybe the atom isn't just full of positively charged matter. Maybe the atom is actually mostly full of empty space because most of these particles went through the gold, but a handful of them, a significant enough amount of them were deflected back towards where they were shot from. So that must mean that there's a dense, positively charged center in the atom, which is called the nucleus. And the nucleus is filled with positively charged particles called protons. So Rutherford changed the atomic model quite a bit. Instead of the model looking like this, like a chocolate chip cookie, his model had a center the nucleus, and most of the atom was made up of empty space. And Rutherford didn't really account for the electrons in his model. What he focused on were the protons and the nucleus. So the nucleus was filled with positively charged protons, and most of the atom was empty space. So again, Rutherford did not account for electrons in his atomic model, but the next person, Bohr, he did a lot of work with electrons. He was a Danish scientist. He made his theory in around 1913. And what Bohr suggested was that electrons are in energy levels in the atom. His model is known as the solar system model because it kind of looks like a solar system. So Bohr thought that electrons were in energy levels in the atom. So if we have the nucleus, what Bohr thought is that the electrons were moving in orbits around the nucleus. So here's our electrons, they're moving in orbits around the nucleus. And he did think that electrons could jump between the orbits, but they could not be in an in-between phase. So there could not be any electrons like in this section where there's not an orbit or even like in this section or over here. Electrons had to be in specific orbits somewhere around the nucleus. And where he got this idea from was from the atomic emission spectrum of hydrogen. So the atomic emission spectrum, so you take a hydrogen atom and you pump it full of energy. And when you do that, the electrons move up in an energy level, they become excited, and then eventually they're gonna relax and go back down to where they were before. But during this process, when they relax, they have to get rid of that energy somehow. And so they actually emit that energy in the form of visible light. And if electrons were not in specific energy levels, 
this light would be known as a continuous spectrum. It would be something like a prism where you see all the colors of the rainbow at the same time. But that was not the case when the electrons came back down to their energy level and gave off visible light, they actually gave off specific wavelengths of light in specific colors. So that led Bohr to believe that electrons must have quantized energy. The electrons must be quantized, which means they have to have a specific amount of energy and they must be in orbits somewhere around the nucleus that corresponds to the specific amount of energy that they possess. And Bohr was almost correct. He was on the right track, but he was missing a little bit of key information. One problem with his theory was that um, his model actually only worked for hydrogen, didn't work for any other elements on the periodic table, which was definitely a red flag. But the next guy, his name was Schrodinger, and he put his theory together in around 1926. And he made a little bit more sense out of what was actually happening with electrons on the atomic level. So Schrodinger put together the cloud model, and he agreed with Bohr that electrons have quantized energy, which means that, again, they have a specific amount of energy, and they are in specific places around the nucleus, but he did not think that we could know the precise exact location of where electrons actually were. So he put together a cloud model, which actually shows the probability of where we would find electrons. And he called the places that we would find electrons atomic orbitals, and that's where there's a 90% chance of finding an electron in the atom. And the different orbital shapes we have are S, which is a sphere, P, which is a dumbbell, D, which kind of looks like a flower, and F, which looks like an even more intense flower. And so if we had the nucleus, and let's say that we have electrons in orbital S. So here's our S orbital, it looks like a sphere. And that means that there's a 90% chance of finding electrons somewhere in this orbital. That also means that there's a 10% chance that electrons may not be there. But Schrodinger was actually more accurate than Bohr because it is impossible to know exactly where electrons are if we hit them with energy to try and figure out where they are. When we hit them with energy, they actually move to a different location. So it's impossible to pinpoint exactly where an electron is at any given point, but we can look at where they have been in the past. So that's how Schrodinger put this cloud model together is he looked at where electrons have been in the past and showed that there's a high probability that they're gonna be in a certain location at any given time. So the cloud model where you see a high density of dots, that is where there's a high probability of finding an electron at any given moment. And the last person we need to briefly talk about was James Chadwick. In Chadwick, in 1932, he finally discovered the neutron. And the neutron was the last to be discovered because it doesn't have an electric charge. It's not positive, it's not negative. So it was the more challenging subatomic particle to find for sure. This was a map of the atomic theory. I hope this was helpful for you in understanding how we got to the theory of the atom that we have now. Thank you so much for stopping by. If you have any other questions, make sure and check out my channel.